Welcome back to The Fast Neutron. In today's video, we're going to introduce some of the theory and math behind neutron scattering, one of the most important phenomena in all of nuclear engineering. Our last video discussed binary nuclear reactions. Now some of the math that we introduced at the end of that video will make an appearance at the start of this one, so feel free to give the last video a watch. Today, we'll start by talking through the kinematics of neutron scattering and the possible energies that neutrons can take on after scattering. And then from there, we'll introduce a concept called neutron lethargy, which is a quantity unique to nuclear engineering. Finally, we'll show how scattering in different materials causes different changes in neutron lethargy. To start things off, let's bring back our formula which described the outgoing energy of the light product from a binary nuclear reaction. The square root of the outgoing energy of the light product is equal to a plus or minus the square root of a squared plus b, where a and b are quantities defined in terms of the masses of the reaction participants, the angle at which the light product leaves the reaction relative to its incident path, and the reaction's q value. Although it may seem like binary nuclear reactions always feature a change in the makeup of the reaction participants, this doesn't actually have to be the case. Neutron scattering is one example of a binary nuclear reaction where the reaction precursors and products are identical to one another. We start with a neutron and a target for it to scatter off, and we end with the same neutron and the same target. Of course, there will be energy exchanged through the scattering event itself, but we aren't producing any new particles or anything like that, at least for elastic scattering. So let's label our diagram of a prototypic binary nuclear reaction to represent a neutron scattering off of a nucleus. Our projectile particle is of course a neutron, and the target is the nucleus, and then after scattering, the light product is the same neutron, and the heavy product is the same nucleus. This lets us simplify our expressions for A and B a little bit, since the projectile and the light product are identical, and the target and the heavy product are identical. M sub n is our symbol for the mass of a neutron, and big M is the symbol for the mass of the nucleus. Let's plug in our new forms for A and B, and we get this ugly equation, but we can do a little simplification to get things to look a bit nicer. First, we can factor out a 1 over m plus m sub n from the right-hand side of the equation, and then from there we can square both sides to get an expression for E prime, the outgoing neutron energy. Now notice that the variables that can really change in this expression for a given reaction are the angle of scattering and the reaction Q value. Everything else is just some combination of the neutron and the nucleus masses, which is a constant. If we define a new constant, big A, as the ratio of the nucleus's mass to the neutron's mass, we can get these mass-based coefficients to be a little bit simpler. A good approximation that we can make here is that this ratio is really just the mass number of the nucleus. After all, the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, which have nearly the same mass. This approximation isn't perfect, of course, since nuclear bonding energy factors into the mass of the nucleus through the mass defect, and protons and neutrons don't have exactly the same mass but it's close to being true. If we convert all of our mass values to be in terms of the mass of a neutron, m sub n goes to 1 and big M goes to A. Now we have a formula which is a little easier to digest. It relates the energy of the neutron after scattering to its initial energy, the angle at which it scatters, and the mass number of the nucleus that it scatters off of. Let's look at how changing the mass of the target and the angle of scattering affects the outgoing neutron energy. When I was studying neutron scattering in school, one thing that really helped me understand the kinematics of this problem was my professor plotting the angle of scattering as a function of the outgoing neutron energy. So let's do that. If we rearrange our formula to solve for the cosine of the scattering angle, we get the following expression. First, let's plot our curve for the case of a neutron scattering off of a proton. At the top right of the curve, we see that the cosine of the scattering angle is 1, which means that the scattering angle itself is 0. Here, the post-scatter energy of the neutron, E prime, is equal to its incident energy, so the neutron didn't really lose any energy. This represents a scattering event where the neutron just barely interacts with the proton, and continues on its way in the same direction from which it came. As the scattering angle grows larger and the cosine decreases, we see that the neutron transfers more and more energy to the proton. Finally, there's the case where E prime is equal to zero, this corresponds to a scattering event where the neutron transfers all of its energy to the proton and stops dead in its tracks. Now this is only possible if the neutron is scattering off of something that has the same mass as it does, so a proton or another neutron. If the target that the neutron hits is heavier than it is, this can't occur. The neutron cannot physically transfer all of its energy through a scatter to the target. 
If this seems weird, a good analogy is to think about billiard balls. If you're playing pool and you hit the cue ball perfectly at another ball, the cue ball will stop in its tracks and the other ball will go rolling away. However, if for some reason you decided to hit a cue ball at a bowling ball sitting on the table in the exact same manner, the cue ball would transfer some of its energy to the bowling ball, but it would bounce back at you. Another interesting thing to note here is that the cosine of the scattering angle cannot be negative, which means that the neutron can't backscatter off a proton under any circumstance. So let's plot this curve again, but this time for a heavier target. Let's bump A from 1, the value corresponding to a proton, to 2. Here, we can see that it's still possible for the neutron to lose zero energy and continue on its original path, but it's not possible for it to lose all of its energy. The lowest possible energy the neutron can leave with comes when the cosine of the scattering angle is negative one, which means the neutron bounces back in the opposite direction from which it came. Now we'll derive an expression for this lowest possible energy in just a second, but for now, let's just say it's equal to some factor alpha times our incident energy. If we keep increasing the mass of the target, alpha E gets closer and closer to our incident energy, meaning that the neutron is able to transfer less and less energy through a scattering event. If the mass of the target was infinite, this curve becomes a straight line up and down at E. This is analogous to the neutron scattering off of some immovable point. No matter what angle it bounces away with, it's going to transfer no energy at all. Now, let's quickly calculate what that minimum post-scatter energy for a neutron is. We'll assume that our scatter is elastic, so the Q value is zero. And for any A value greater than one, this is going to occur when the neutron perfectly backscatters, so the scattering angle is 180 degrees and the cosine of the scattering angle is negative one. Plugging this value in and doing a little bit of simplification gives a value of A minus one over A plus one all squared times the original incident energy. This is our alpha term, and as A grows larger, it approaches one. So now we know how to calculate the final neutron energy for a given scatter. But what is the probability that the neutron will have any one energy versus another? That is to say, what is the probability density function which describes post-scatter energies? Well, it's about as simple as it gets. It's a uniform distribution. For an incident energy E, all post-scatter energies between E and alpha E are equally likely. So the probability density function, which describes the probability per energy that a neutron scatters from E to E prime, assuming that Q is zero, can be written as follows. With this probability density function, we can calculate the average loss of energy for a neutron during a scattering event. This is just equal to the initial energy minus the average post-scatter energy. And since we have this probability density function, we can calculate its mean value by simply integrating E times that function over the function's whole domain. So we do a little algebra, and we end up with the result that the average loss in energy is one half times the quantity one minus alpha times E, which is right in the middle of our uniform distribution as expected. Okay, now that we have a good understanding of the basic math behind neutron elastic scattering, I wanna point out that a lot of our formulas here are all still dependent on the incident energy. Now this makes sense, as the amount of energy exchanged by scattering events is undoubtedly a function of the incident energy, but there is a quantity that nuclear engineers use to describe how neutrons gain and lose energy, which can make some of the math that's going to come a little bit easier. This quantity is called lethargy, and we represent it with the letter u. Lethargy is defined as the natural logarithm of the ratio of some reference energy E0 and our neutron's energy E. Now, e naught is typically selected to be the maximum neutron energy that we expect to see in our system. So in a nuclear reactor, it could be the energy of a neutron right after it emerges from a fission event. Notice that lethargy is dimensionless, and it actually increases in magnitude with lower energies. Here's a plot of lethargy as a function of energy for some e naught. Now, this may seem like a pretty random quantity to introduce, but what's nice about lethargy is that it sort of eliminates a lot of that pesky dependence on incident energy from the formulas that we described previously. And it makes it so that you can sort of treat every scattering event as being equivalent, in some sense. To show this, let's take a look at how changes in energy correspond to changes in lethargy. Now with a little algebra, we can show that going from E to E prime results in a change in lethargy equal to the natural log of E over E prime. Now recall that our minimum change in energy is when E prime is equal to E, and this results in no change in lethargy, which makes sense. And our maximum change in energy happens when we backscatter and go from E to alpha E. 
Now in terms of a change in lethargy, this is when lethargy increases by the natural log of 1 over alpha. So our energy dependence has been removed. It doesn't matter if our neutron has 10 MeV of energy or a fraction of an EV, its maximum change in lethargy for a scatter is the same. Now just like we did before for energy, let's calculate the average change in lethargy for a scattering event. We start by constructing our probability density function for lethargy as follows. Every differential slice of our lethargy function should match that of the energy function, so we write the following equality. And then we can calculate DE prime over DU prime trivially, since we already have defined the function which relates energy and lethargy. And then we just plug in our energy probability density function from earlier, and we get our result. So to calculate our mean change in lethargy, we follow the same procedure as before and integrate our lethargy probability density function times u prime. Now this can be made a little easier if we define a helper variable x, which is the change in lethargy. The symbol we normally use to represent the mean change in lethargy is psi, which is unfortunate because it's impossible to write in your notes. And I'll spare you a full description of the math, but with a little help from integration by parts, we can't get an answer. The mean change in lethargy for a scattering interaction is 1 plus alpha times the natural log of alpha over 1 minus alpha. So if a is 1, psi is 1, and if a is larger than 1, psi is smaller than 1. Notice that this value is completely independent of the initial lethargy. It's just a function of the mass number of the target. In a very real sense, the value of psi for some material sort of describes how effective that material is at slowing down neutrons. The closer psi is to 1, the better the material is at quickly pulling energy out of neutrons through scattering. Because there's no dependence on the initial lethargy, we can calculate the mean change in lethargy for n collisions by simply multiplying psi by n. Now this calculation would be much more involved if we tried to calculate the mean change in energy after n collisions without the help of lethargy. We can sort of flip this around and find out how many scatters we expect it will take for a neutron to go from one energy to another with the formula n equals 1 over psi times the change in lethargy, or 1 over psi times the natural log of our initial energy divided by the final energy. To wrap things up, I want to show a quick simulation which sort of proves this out. We'll do a little Monte Carlo simulation here, where we simulate a number of neutrons which all start at 2 MeV, and we'll see how many scatters on average it will take for them to scatter down to 1 EV. Our first example will be for A equals 1. This is analogous to neutrons scattering off of protons or hydrogen 1. For each energy, we'll start with a neutron at 2 MeV, and then we'll randomly sample a new energy from the probability density function that we saw earlier. We'll then repeat this process and record the number of scatters it takes to get our energy below 1 EV. Here's a quick example of how that will look in terms of our neutron energies. So our neutron starts with 2 MeV, and it looks like it took about 11 scatters to get down to 1 EV. A few more simulations seem to do about the same, but some end up taking a little bit more. Now that was just for a couple of cases, and we need to get good statistics here, so instead let's simulate a few thousand and see how things shake out. For A equals 1, our alpha value is equal to 0, and our average change in lethargy is defined to be 1. So we start to perform our simulations, and we see that the average value for the number of scatters it took to reach 1 EV converges to about 14.47. If we analytically calculate the expected value with our formula from earlier, it comes out to around 14.5. Some neutrons took only a couple of scatters to reach 1 EV, and some took closer to 30, but on average, a neutron scattering in the best possible medium for slowing it down takes only around 14 scatters to reduce its energy by a factor of 2 million. Now let's up our A value to 2. So the medium our neutron is scattering in is composed of particles twice the mass of the neutron itself. This could be something like deuterium in heavy water, which is used to slow down neutrons in Canadian nuclear reactors. Here, our alpha value is 0.11, and our average change in lethargy per scatter is 0.73. This is less than the previous value of 1, which shows that this material will be worse at slowing down neutrons. After a bunch of simulations, we see that it takes on average 19.83 scatters to get from 2 MeV to 1 EV. This lines up with our prediction of about 20. Finally, let's up A to 12. This could be something like carbon, which is used to slow down neutrons in most gas-cooled reactors. 
Here, our alpha value rises to 0.72, and our average change in lethargy per scatter drops to 0.16. Our simulation, after a little bit of time, predicts that it takes 19.74 scatters to reach 1 EV. This lines up with our prediction of about 92 analytically. These simulations prove out the fact that heavier materials are worse at slowing down neutrons. If you plot the expected number of collisions needed to go from 2 MeV to 1 EV as a function of big A, you can see that there's more or less a linear relationship, but the number of scatters increases pretty quickly. For Iron 54, the expected number of collisions rises to 411, and for our old friend Uranium 238, it takes on average a whopping 1,730 collisions. For reasons we'll get into in future videos, this trend has profound implications on how we pick materials for use in different types of nuclear reactors. And the materials we pick directly impact things like how efficient reactors are at utilizing neutrons, how long we can leave components in our reactor cores before they need to be replaced, and whether or not we can construct reactors to do crazy things like produce their own fuel or take nuclear waste from other reactors and use it as fuel. For now, I hope this video has given you a good introduction to neutron scattering and how it impacts neutron energies. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to do a deep dive on nuclear reaction cross sections. This will be the final stepping stone before we're ready to start introducing the basic concepts of reactor theory. See you there.